Good morning, Rob. Great to be here on this rainy, lovely day. Is it still raining out there, or did it calm down a little bit? It's calmed down a little bit on this side of the uh, county line, at least. Jefferson, yeah. it was pouring pretty good when I started over here. Got a good one? Yeah. yeah. That uh, professional voice that you hear right there, we... We have to be on our best behavior, Bill, because we got a guy who knows radio in the room with us right now. No more of this amateurish stuff. We've got to step up our game. And he can always he can also pronounce English like the Queen's English. <laughs> <laughs> which I which you've reminded me on many occasion I do not meet that threshold. Admiral, we should all strive to talk like you. Every day. Every single day. No, oh, we don't want that. We don't want that. No. <laughs> I just always love to hear the stories of you taking French classes. That's <laughs> yeah. always the best. Our guest in this segment is Troy Miller. He's a candidate for the House of Delegates out of the 98th Democratic side of things. Troy, good morning. Thanks for coming in. Thank you so much for having me, Rob. I appreciate it. I'm so happy to be here and talk to you and your audience. Yeah, tell me about your radio background here. Um, well, it's a, it's a, I'll start with my whole life story, I guess. I am originally from Wheeling, West Virginia, which is why I sound the way I do, probably. Um, I grew up there for the first 18 years. My parents are from there. Their parents are from there. I think once you get up a little above there, you start finding people who aren't from there. But I moved to Washington, D.C. when I turned 18. I was fortunate enough to be accepted at Georgetown University. I studied at their School of Foreign Service. I studied science, technology, and international affairs with a um, focus on energy and environmental policy and really development and looking at how West Virginia's economy and other resource-rich economies like West Virginia mm -hmm. can continue to uh, exist in the global environmental crises that we face also. Um, when I graduated in 2013, there was not a whole lot of work here in West Virginia yet in that field. So I moved back to Washington, D.C. and started working as a contractor for We Act Radio, which at that time was 1480 AM. It is now online only, but we are always working to get our signal back on terrestrial. And uh, I've been working with them for about 10 years now on and off. Uh, I worked with Tom Hartman in the meantime, who is for people who don't know, he is one of the top 10 talkers in the country. He's the only liberal on that list of top 10 talkers. And uh, I helped him write a series of books also. And uh, when he moved out to Portland, Oregon, my wife and I started looking around at our rent in Washington, D.C. and going, well, we were working from home six out of seven days a week. It'd be nice to move back to West Virginia. And Jefferson County was in, uh, split the difference and was more affordable at the end of 2018 than it is now. Sure. Um, but we've been here now for about six years, and the entire time I was in West Virginia, I sort of served as an unofficial West Virginia delegate anyway, as being one of the few West Virginians at Georgetown at that time. I had to hear every joke in the book and uh, also to you know talk about what our politics are like and try to explain how, why things were going, go the way they do. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of the broad context of why I'm running here too is that um, throughout that time I was writing op-eds in the Gazette Mail. I was, um, I've been very opposed to many of the majority party's plans over the last 10 years. And to that effect, I'll say what I see is a very, it's a slower movement. But back in 2014 and 15, um, if people will recall, Sam Brownback was the governor of Kansas, and he was, and it was a ruby red state with the legislature, and they were very excited to introduce what they called the red state model, which was basically long bunch of tax cuts uh, and a bunch of cuts to so social services, and then their bond rating cratered, and they uh, pretty much immediately. Uh, rescinded all of that, and many Democrats were elected into the Kansas legislature. I think our Republicans here saw that and realized that they can't do that quite as fast, but they're marching us along the same track is what I'm seeing. So um, I really believe that District 98 deserves people who, deserves a representative who is fighting for working West Virginians, who is fighting for, and I will say I also have a history of uh, advocacy and organizing with a group called Social Security Works. I'm currently uh, the, their Appalachian organizer, and when I was their West Virginia organizer, we were on the front lines of um, what was then Build Back Better, mm -hmm. and the drug pricing negotiation, the Medicare pricing negotiations, all of the prescription drug cost um, reductions that were wrapped in there, and when Senator Joe Manchin said he couldn't vote for Build Back Better because it was going to be inflationary, we mobilized around that. I wrote an op-ed, maybe two, in the Gazette Mail explaining that if you want to take on the type of inflation that kills West Virginians every year and is higher than national inflation every year, it doesn't matter whether U.S. inflation is low or high, 
drug price inflation outpaces at 15, 20 percent, and that's if, depending upon what classes of drugs you're looking at. Drug prices and college tuition. Yes. And 90% of West Virginians are either on a prescription drug or live with somebody who's on a prescription drug. So this is really directly in, in uh, West Virginians' pockets, and it does cost people their lives. More than that, more than one out of five West Virginians are, are receive their earned Social Security benefits. Almost one out of five West Virginians are on Medicare, and the discrepancy there is probably because a lot of people don't realize this, but Social Security also covers disability insurance, uh, orphan benefits, survivor benefits, all of these things, and there it is essential in our state. So I've been proud to fight for these issues, and I'm glad that Senator Manchin uh, introduced the Inflation Reduction Act with these uh, provisions as the keystone of it. and. Um, I've been proud to work in both the media world around this and the advocacy world around this, and now I'm asking for the members of district or voters of District 98 to vote for me to send me to the legislature to continue these fights. Billy, uh, yeah, you forgot to mention you're also working on your Master's of Art degrees in Appalachian Studies at Shepherd. I am, and with that, I am actually working. My academic research is looking at extractive industries in the history in Appalachia. And what I think people frequently have said, you know, timber is the, one of the first extractive industries. I think it goes back far further than that. I think when you look back at it, the fur trade and the harvesting of beavers across the eastern seaboard of America, which went on in this region before settlers came in because of how the nature of the trade was. And I think that fundamentally transformed the landscape before even the first Europeans really settled here in the Shepherdstown area, for instance, and you hear these stories about trees so wide that people could hold hold meetings in them, right? It's once you take the beavers out of an ecosystem, they, uh, the ecosystem rapidly transforms. Those dams need maintained. Many of those dams are multi-generational dams, and um, the landscape changes rapidly. And there's not much evidence left either because of the nature of very wet landscapes and how they don't fossilize in the same way. So your studies on extraction services and the impact is... Uh, are you focusing on the eastern panhandle? Are you focusing state as a statewide? I look statewide, and really with that, I'm looking region-wide. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I've had to kind of push back against with that is when I say the fur trade or um, the beaver wars, people go, isn't that new France? What does that have to do with here? And what I'll remind people of is that the Appalachian geographical region extends from New Finland to Georgia. Sure. Um, and that does the, the Appalachian Regional Commission, which is the political boundaries, is smaller, but the, um, the beavers don't respect the political yeah. boundaries. <laughs> yeah. Looking at your, um, uh, your platform there, it's fairly what I'd consider to be liberal or progressive. If you had been in the House this past session or so, would you have voted for the tax reduction? I don't think I would have. I feel like one of the issues with our legislature right now, and this goes back to that uh, red state model, Kansas experiment, is that we've kind of, we put the cart before the horse. We've decided we want tax breaks and we're going to do those and we'll figure out the rest after the fact. And um, my issue with that is the same that I have sort of issue here in the county where it feels like um, we're treating development as a goal unto itself rather than a process by which we achieve the goals that we lay out in, say, our comprehensive plan. And I personally do not think money flying around um, has any sort of, you know, it makes books look good and you can say the nut lines on the charts are going up, but if it's not materially improving people's lives in the state, then I think it's uh, for not. We've had a lot of money fly around all through the state's history, right? That's, a, you know, I think of Ross Perot and the large sucking sound of all of the money and wealth leaving. He was talking about America with the trade deals, um, but here it's the, uh, it's, the, it's the extractive resources and how we're not adequately, for instance, had we properly excise taxed uh, natural gas and coal over the last hundred years, we could have a welfare fund like, uh, or a general welfare fund like in Alaska, and we could be paying out dividends to every, every member, every person in West Virginia on that fund. Um, we did not do that, and we can't get that money back. But what we can do is not race to cut taxes to further drive a hole in a budget that I feel like is kind of a mystery budget anyway. I keep on thinking about this. I think it was a $250 million that came into the state from the feds to spend on schools that was included in the budget that was uh, talked about earlier this year. And then the feds came back and said, you all have to actually spend that on schools or else we're taking it back. 
Now that seems to me not um, running government like a business or anything. That seems to me like leaving money on the table for ideological reasons. And when they decided to spend the money, they were able to clear, as I recall, basically every school maintenance project in the state and still have a little bit of money left over. Um, I might have that a little bit off, but that's how I recall that happening earlier this year. Okay, on the subject of schools uh, and also money, uh, it's often been cited that we spend more per student than any um, uh, any state in the in the country, and yet our test scores are among the lowest. How would you reconcile this? How would you address our school problem? It is, it is a structural issue, and we're compounding the issue in many ways. I think the solution has been presented to give people school choice through vouchers, ESAs, all these different programs. And what I see there is not, um, not, doing, not fulfilling the promise of the general welfare that the state constitution and the U.S. Constitution lay out the purpose of the state to do. Um, because there is no requirement for those schools to accept every student. And so I think it's kind of the, you know, I'm happy for every student and every family who has been able to place their kids into good schools, but there's no requirement for a private school to um, not discriminate based on any number of reasons, and we can't know necessarily the reasons they reject a student. Um, I think if we are to be earnest with ourselves, what we need is to be discussing with the private and charter schools, how do they provide, deliver such better test scores for so much less money. And I think a part of the answer here might actually be they choose their students. But if there are other methods, then the public schools should absolutely be able to learn from those and adapt from those. Um, but they are structural issues, they're long standing, and you can see the uh, what I would call a war against public schooling in this state going back to the 70s with the uh, Kanawha textbook wars. So for the first time, I've heard a comparison between our public schools and certificate of need because certificate of need has made the argument that uh, uh, cherry picking, and you're saying the same thing with the alternative schools, they're cherry picking, cherry picking. Yeah, and I think this is, I mean, this is my problem also with the insurance, the health insurance industry in general, and um, why I am so un, unnerved by these calls to deregulate the health insurance industry further because um, many people might not be old enough to remember, and I'm barely old enough to remember, um, the, the time when people could be denied for pre-existing conditions, which is defeating. Um, beyond that, here in West Virginia, we have one of the lowest uninsured rates in the country, one of the highest insured rates in the country, and one of the worst sets of health outcomes in the country, um, which goes to show that insurance doesn't mean anything if we're not filling in the infrastructural needs here in Jefferson County, for instance, if you have a heart attack up on the mountain, you may not, there isn't any guarantee that an ambulance can get there from Virginia in time to do anything to save your life. Um, these are the types of issues that we really need to be, and it requires investment. Now to go back to the question of why are we spending so much more per student than anywhere else and getting worse results, again, this is a structural issue and we need to be talking to all of the different stakeholders. I imagine part, a large part of it is that we are a rural state and there has been pushback against public schools for many decades and we've been on the front end of this. There's also well-funded efforts to, you know, uh, undo public schooling in America, and I think we've been uh, subject to that to, some, to a large degree also. How do you go and get your message out, uh, Troy? For one thing, you're, uh, you're a Democrat in a, in a red state, also in a county that's becoming progressive red all the time. Your platform is, is unquestionably on the progressive side. How are you going to get your message out and become competitive in the race? Well, first of all, I'm going to show up to as many media appearances like this that will give me a platform. And to the question of my what my platform looks like, it is um, grounded in what is called the 21st Century Economic Bill of Rights. The 21st Century Economic Bill of Rights is itself rooted in what FDR introduced in 1944 as a second Bill of Rights or an Economic Bill of Rights, saying, in essence, at that point, um, the project of America has is has started with these securing civil rights, political rights, and to the extent that we had secured those in America for everyone, and we hadn't, this is before the civil rights movement, for instance, um, we needed to be then make sure that people could secure what he called the four freedoms. 
And those freedoms include freedom from fear, freedom from want, freedom to practice and uh, speech and uh, practice religion as one wants. And I'm drawing a blank on the fourth one. But all of this is to say this is not some extreme liberal, extreme progressive platform in any means. I would call this the radical center of America. I would call this every bit as radical as our founding fathers. Um, so I'm going to continue saying that to everybody who will listen. Beyond that, and that my order includes, there is a job that pays a living wage, a voice in the workplace through collective bargaining in a union, a complete cost-free public education, access to broadband internet, which I would argue is a critical issue here in West Virginia. Um, many people do not have access to broadband internet, and it is fu as fundamental as can you check your voter registration and can you apply for a job, right? So many jobs these days, even as simple jobs, that, or not simple jobs, but entry-level jobs at Walmart and Target and places require an online application to even begin the process. How do you do that without broadband internet? Um, the list goes on, but none of these are particularly radical. And I think with the, where people get con a little bit confused is they say, well, you're going to do, you know, what legislation is going to do any of these things? Well, I'd say, first of all, a... Uh, one way to do this is to repeal right to work for less in West Virginia and, and guarantee that people can have a work right to uh, workplace participation in a union and not be subject to free riders who are getting the same benefits. Um, but beyond that, you take every piece of legislation and you hold this up and you say, is this working to secure one of these rights for somebody or is this working to take one of these rights away from somebody? And um, I think that is a very reasonable, very moderate, uh, very center of the road approach to this. Um, which is not to say any of these things are my way or the highway or anything like that. We can work across the aisle to achieve these things. What we need to agree on is that we want to achieve these things rather than saying we want to achieve tax cuts and figure out the rest later. Troy Miller is our guest here, candidate in the 98th. His opponent is Joe Funkhauser. Uh, just to clarify a couple of things, Troy was born in Wheeling and raised in Wheeling. He is a native West Virginian. He didn't move here from Washington, D.C., bringing them liberal values with him. Uh, he, he did move here from Washington, D.C. when, uh, uh, what, how many years ago now? That was about six years ago about now. six years ago to Jefferson County, but he was born and raised in West Virginia. Troy, uh, a couple of things I'll throw by your attention here. Uh, based on the discussions that you just had with Bill, I'm going to guess that you are not in favor of the Hope Scholarship, or you are? I am generally, I'm, I mean, the cat's out of the bag with it now. I don't think that we should have done this, and I think it will ultimately weaken our public school system. I think as we, um, as people move across districts, our, the school aid funding formula is going to get messed up. Here in Jefferson County, in my district, they're talking about uh, closing North Jefferson Elementary. Yes, and, and you spoke about that last night, if I, I did, recall. I did. Well, how did uh, that go? I was hopeful that they were going to vote last night, and it seemed like the vote was going to be towards keeping the school open. Um, they did not, and so it is still kind of a cliffhanger. Um, but I, you know, I think I heard one person over two nights of public comment say that the school should be closed, and everybody else said, uh, and regardless of how you're looking at the test scores um, versus nationally or anything like this, the the teachers, the staff there are providing what the students need. They are providing an essential service. And what I said very simply last night was looking at the impact statement they had uh, produced. It seems like it, the end result of closing the school and moving all the students around and not knowing exactly where to put the autism uh, program and not knowing exactly how they're going to deal with 30% of the students at North Jefferson being on uh, individualized education programs. Um, the, the, it's 1.3 million in savings, of which net savings, they're looking at $840,000 in staff. Now that tells me either that they're not planning on keeping all their staff or that their savings aren't real. Beyond that, if those savings are real, that's an $840,000 cut in economic development directly into that district because that is going directly into people's pockets who then spend that money on rent, on mortgage, on uh, food, on things in the district and keep the local economy going. And I think this is another one of these things that we've kind of missed in the conversation of conservatives want a smaller government and liberals want bigger government is that what we all want is good economic development and that requires money to circulate in an economy that's very simple and so i believe that you know if we're going to run government like a business one of the things you do with a business is you make investments in things that will make the business easier if we want businesses to come here in jefferson county we and we want workers to come here to jefferson county we need to be able to guarantee that like they can get uh 
child care, which now, right now in Jefferson County, is a 13-month wait list. Well, let's talk about that because the governor has proposed some child tax credits, child care tax credits, and I think that may be discussed September the 30th when they get together again. If not, then the following week, who knows? Uh, your thoughts on that as to what the state legislature's role should be in this? I, you know, I think the uh, child care tax credit will help people afford child care, but it doesn't do anything to actually make sure the child care is there. And it goes back to that issue of uh, we have the, one of the highest insured rates, but one of the worst sets of health outcomes. If you can't access the services, if you can't then afford the services, right? And what this is a, the example I use of the difference between access and affordability is I have access to a Rolls Royce dealership. I can walk in, they'll even shake my hand, they might even let me test drive the car, but I cannot drive away with a Rolls Royce. Bill can, but the rest of us can't. <laughs> Don't but, listen to him, and, Troy. But health care shouldn't be like that, would be would be my point. And child care shouldn't be like that. So I'm glad that they're taking steps to address the affordability issue of that. But we need to address the structural issues of how do we get more child care providers in areas without those providers. How, how do you do that? What is the government's role in encouraging certain people to go into certain jobs that right now they don't appear to want to go into? Well, I mean, to uh, helping people with tuition into uh, the training programs or helping people get the certificates, I do think there is a case to be made that um, maybe some of the certifications required are onerous. On the other hand, we also, there, if there's one thing we don't want, it's that we don't want to be leaving our kids and our child care in people's care who are not certified, who are not responsible, who have not met all of the criteria that we would need and that they are extensive, right? Um, I do not currently have children. I hope to in the near future, but um, I can't imagine going through the process of, of raising a child to the point where they're ready to be dropped off in care and not knowing that, that the, the provider is fully certified in a way that will provide some sort of assurance. And not a criminal. Right, exactly, to su suffice it to say. And not setting themselves up to be a criminal because the problem is um, there is a, a self-selection bias where people who want access to children for nefarious means will try to access children through mm -hmm. innocent means and they will try to earn people's trust. That's real. Um, the and. Uh, so the, the, but the structural issues will require investment, it will require, it might require more state facilities. It might require us to say at the outset that government is not our enemy and that our government, because it is our government by elected by the people, can do things that the people need done, again, to provide for that general welfare. Um, about a minute left. The mic is yours. Tell people why they should vote for you and how they can find out about your campaign. Um, for all of the reasons I've laid out during this uh, interview, you should vote for me. We are fighting for a 21st century economic bill of rights. We are fighting for a government that will work for all West Virginians um, and not just corporate interests. And you can find out more about me and my campaign. You can find videos of me talking about some of these various issues at Troy4WV.com. That's T-R-O-Y-F-O-R-W-V.com. I'm on pretty much all the social medias. If you email me through that website, I will be the one who gets back to you. And I do want to hear from you, um, whether you have agreed with everything I've said, disagreed with everything I say, um, because at the very, at the end of the day, I am will be elected as a delegate, or I hope to be elected as a delegate for all people of D District 98. And that means my opponents as well. Um, I want to hear from you, and I want to serve you. And I, again, I think we need to get back to the sense of, uh, our elected officials are public servants, and they are engaged in public service. And thank you so much for the time. Troy, thank you for coming in. We'll have Troy at our candidate forum. He's agreed to come to that, too. Joe Funkhauser, his opponent, will be there as well.